Okay, admit it, you probably don't know anything about this country. Which is great, because that's exactly the type of video I love making on this channel. Welcome to our final Melanesian country, our final Oceanian nation, our final island nation, the land of beautiful catastrophes, Vanuatu. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Feel free to get some Geography Now merch like this Geography Now shirt or this Geography Now mug at geographynow.com. Or you can get this Geography Now figurine at figgyme.com. That's right, I am now a figurine. It's so weird. And fun fact, the globe in the figurine is actually a secret key that you can unlock with the mug at... No, I'm just kidding. Anywho, so we are back in Oceania, aka the world's most remote and least researched area. Be honest, have you even heard of this place? <laughs> Yeah, of course I have. Okay, then tell me something about it. It's in Oceania. You just said that. You win this round. But other than that, let's jump into the episode. Like we Vanu ought to. <laughs> Oh, this is the worst coffee ever. I was desperate and I was in a rush and I got the instant stuff. It's, ugh, whatever. So, as you'll soon see, Vanuatu has a very unique way of administering itself and a lot of it has to do with the weird mixture of culture, history, and extreme danger. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's first jump into the motion graphic, shall we? First of all, the country is located in the geographic subregion known as Melanesia, which extends all the way from the island of Papua, split between Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, shielding the entire northeast coast of Australia, ending with Norfolk Island and Fiji. The country is made up of 82 islands, stretching about 540 miles, 870 kilometers, from Hugh Island in the Torres Island chain up north to the southernmost island, Anatom. Some people dispute that the Matthew and Hunter Islands further south technically should belong to Vanuatu, but today they are under the jurisdiction of France's New Caledonia, just further southwest of them. Also, you can remember it's Vanuatu because the islands kind of make up a V shape. Eh, technically a Y, but whatever, close enough. In any case, of the 83 islands, there are only 14 of which that have a surface area over 100 square kilometers, the largest three being Espirito Santo, which the locals just call Santo, followed by Malakula and Efate, which, by the way, the country's capital and largest city with about 50,000 people is Port Vila, located on Efate Island. Otherwise, the second largest city with about 20,000 people is Luganville in Santo Island. The country is divided into six provinces made up of certain island clusters, and the name of each province is a portmanteau of the initial letters of the main constituent islands that make them up. For example, Shefa is the Shepherd Islands, and Efate, Penama, is made up of Pentecost Island, Ambae, and Maewo, and so on. Of the 83 islands, 65 are inhabited, and there are about 30 airports and airstrips throughout the country reaching every province. The largest and busiest airport is of course Port Villa's Bowerfield International, which has about 20 destinations, five of which are international. Luganville up north has the only other international airport with service to Brisbane, Australia, and otherwise, your other best option to hop around the country is by taking boats and ferry services, some of the most popular ones being Island Gateway, Big Sista, and Vanuatu Ferry. Okay, so here's the deal. We've already kind of mentioned this in other previous Pacific Island Nation country episodes, but Vanuatu has a very similar pattern of legislation that tries to constantly compromise the official government with traditional ruling systems. The country is a parliamentary republic with a president and prime minister. However, most islands still adhere to the Nakamal system of governance. So basically, most villages have an off-paper traditional chieftain system. Remember we talked about the Fale community meeting halls in the Samoa or Tonga episodes or the Marae of New Zealand and the Ma it's like that. And shocker, almost all parliament members are either chiefs themselves or high-ranking elders within their respective communities. Historically, Vanuatu has been inhabited for over 3,300 years. Archaeological evidence suggests that it all started with the Lapita culture. It was a Neolithic Austronesian people group that are speculated to have originated from what is now the Philippines. And then later on, Melanesian people migrated into the Vanuatu and islands. Later on, the Europeans came in, starting with some Portuguese guy that was sailing for the Spanish crown. The French originally landed on Ambai, and then they also named Pentecost Island, and then the British came in and gave the name to the Shepherds and Banks Islands, and then the weird thing is, for 74 years, Vanuatu was a condominium called the New Hebrides between the British and the French. Condominium? You mean like those multiplex units with the HOA fees? No, 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 no. Condominium, as in the political entity in which multiple sovereign powers agree to jointly share equal codominium status without dividing into national zones. So, two countries controlling one place. You mean like that St. Martin Island? in the Caribbean? Almost, but no, they're legally separated entities with demarcated borders. Are there any in modern day examples that you can give? Yes, the Abia region of Sudan and South Sudan. Okay, I think I get it now. Do you? Nope. I tried, you failed. Oh well. Anyway,
Anyway, so that's basically what Vanuatu was before independence. And it was kind of weird because if you know anything about French and British history in regards to global influence, they usually never, ever, ever wanted to share anything. And in the rare cases where they actually did, it was kind of like, all right, so we hate each other, but we still want this land. Oui, c'est vrai. But obviously we need two systems of police forces and road laws. Oui, et on a besoin de deux systèmes d'éducation et de prison aussi. And two currencies. Oui, et uh, deux services de santé et police étrangère. But like we're totally working together and sharing as one. Oui? Oui. And to be fair, they had a joint court and a native court that handled Melanesian customary law. Yeah, and on top of that, blackbirding was common in the beginning. Blackbirding was the practice in which natives, usually in the Pacific areas, were either forced or deceived into work as indentured servants, usually to Fiji and Australia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Then World War II happened, and Vanuatu was like the front line to make sure that the Japanese didn't advance any further, since they had already taken over Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. This is why you see a lot of military ruin sites in Vanuatu. At the peak of deployment, military personnel actually outnumbered the entire population of Vanuatu. After the Solomon Islands was reoccupied from the Japanese forces, it was like, no reason to stay here anymore, but we have all this leftover equipment, but uh, I'm too tired to ship it back home. Hey Vanuatu, do you want to buy from me for like a super cheap price? Uh, I'll take some of it, I guess. Not all of it? Nah, I'm good. Plus, I don't even think I could afford all of it. Uh, okay then, I guess I'll just dump the rest of it in the ocean. What? And that's how the famous diving spot Million Dollar Point was created. So that's the gist of how Vanuatu looks on paper. Now let's see how Vanuatu got the way it did naturally. And this one's gonna blow your mind, or should I say, erupt your mind. Man, this coffee sucks, but it's giving me energy. <laughs> So imagine a colorful ballerina, beautiful and radiant, that suddenly gets hit by a cement truck and then the truck explodes and drowns in the river. But the ballerina somehow keeps surviving and puts the tutu back on and dances. That's basically Vanuatu, a country laden with lush, vibrant landscape and nature, yet almost every conceivable mother nature catastrophe besides blizzards has been able to successfully strike Vanuatu. And in a weird way, that kind of plays into their culture and daily lives. But first, let's look at the motion graphic, shall we? First of all, separated between the Coral Sea and the Pacific Ocean, Vanuatu sits on the aptly named Vanuatu, or New Hebrides Trench, part of the larger New Hebrides Plate, which is a part of the larger Pacific Plate. It is a subduction zone in which the Australian Plate subducts under the Pacific, making it a part of the larger Ring of Fire, hence making it one of the most volcanically active areas on Earth, which of course is how the islands were formed. This also means earthquakes are not uncommon, about 2,000 seismic events are reported annually, although most of them are less than 5 on the Richter scale. This also means, because the islands are formed from from volcanism, there isn't much of a continental shelf and most shorelines drop rapidly into ocean depths or are rocky with fringing reefs. About half of the country is mountainous and the tallest peak, Tabo Masana, is located on Santo Island, as is the longest river not far away from the peak, the Jordan River, which meanders through the hillsides for about 26 miles, 41 kilometers, until it dumps into the Big Bay. The country has some decently sized inland bodies of water, most of which are confined to the calderas of dormant volcanoes, like the largest lake of the country, Lake Letas, located on Gawa Island up north. Speaking of which, there are several active above and underwater volcanoes in Vanuatu, many of which you can see clearly from satellite imagery. The largest of these is the Marum Volcano on Ambrim Island, which has two massive calderas and a third smaller one, all with beautifully rich dark lava flowways oozing down the sides of the peaks, entangling themselves in the lush green jungles below. On top of that, Vanuatu is in the dead center of the South Pacific El Nino Oscillation Zone, in which cyclones are likely to develop and hit any landmass in the way. So yeah, there's that too. But yeah, for what it's worth, to this day, Vanuatu is labeled as the most at-risk nation in terms of experiencing natural disasters on Earth. As you can see, oftentimes Vanuatu can get bombarded with volcanic eruptions, which in return can be accompanied by the occasional earthquake, which in return can cause tsunamis, which would be terrible if happening during a cyclone, which in return can cause a flooding, which in return can cause things like mudslides. And in the rare chance they all happen at the same time, you would be witnessing a volquick nami flood slide clone. In any case, uh, as you know, it's time for my triple shot of espresso break. Not sure if I even need it because this is good enough as it is. But that means now it's time for Noah to fill in for the rest of this segment. Take it away, Mr. Noah. All right, 
uh, sorry I'm late, just, just taking care of something. Let's get to it. So as Barb's was saying, volcanic activity is just part of daily life in Vanuatu. Like when this one on Ambaye Island started erupting in 2005, and over the course of the next 13 years, nearly all of the island's 11,000 inhabitants had to be evacuated. Some volcanoes, though, are tame enough to foster a tourism industry. Like Mount Yasser on Tana Island, the world's most accessible active volcano. One of the top sites, and you can even get a 360-degree close-up view of the scorching calderas on Google Maps. Check it out. This means much of the soil in Vanuatu is either composed of andosol or volcanic soils or coralline soils made from decomposed raised coral. Today, about 80% of the population depends to some degree on subsistence farming, despite the fact that only about 2% of the land is arable. In fact, about one third of the landmass is made up of dense forests. This plays, of course, into the export industry as the largest products produced by Vanuatu include things like hardwoods, copra, and kava. If you don't know what kava is, all you need to know is that it is super important to practically every island nation in the Pacific and it has no alcohol in it, but it does give off psychoactive effects when consumed. So do be careful if you choose to drink it. Dude, I'd probably drink it. Okay, Barbs. In any case, Luganville, the second largest city, handles about two-thirds of all exports leaving the country. Whereas the capital, Port Vila, is the opposite and handles about 85% of all imports. Surprisingly, one major industry that is speculated to possibly provide somewhere up to 30% of the country's revenue, well, it has to do with, you know, well, we've talked about it in some of the Caribbean episodes. You mean citizenship by investment? Yeah. Demand for Vanuatu citizenship and further obtaining passports has become growing in demand recently. Why? Because of certain perks that come along with it like, say, visa-free or visa on arrival to nearly 100 countries as well as an exemption from income, inheritance, and capital gains taxes. Now, it's not just as simple as forking over a ton of money. You do have to first prove that you've at least lived in Vanuatu for some time and care about it. Nonetheless, once accepted, the process is usually quick and only lasts a few months. The funny thing is, this industry actually accumulates more revenue than the fishing industry, despite Vanuatu being surrounded by, you know, a ton of fish-filled waters. But the vibrant reefs and waters do play a lot in ecotourism, and to talk a little bit more on how the wildlife plays a role, here's our animal guy, Caleb. Put all 16 pigeons in my car and put them Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. I'm back. So let's do an overview of Vanuatu's animals. Basically, if you are an animal and want to migrate to an island, you either have to A, swim far, or B, fly far. This is why prior to human settlement, there were no native species of large land mammals on Vanuatu. The only indigenous mammals are bats, two of which are endemic. Otherwise, Vanuatu is a bird and reptile paradise with over 120 bird species and about 40 reptile species, including the national animals, the Vanuatu megapode, and the iguana. However, many dispute this, saying that the wild boar is actually the national animal of Vanuatu, and their tusks are prized across the islands. In fact, none of the animals in Vanuatu are really dangerous. None of the snakes or spiders are venomous. The only animal that might be a threat to you is... Centipedes! If you step on one of these little guys, they might occasionally bite you, injecting a little bit of venom. Also, they love hiding in shoes, so check your shoes before putting them on. One nightmare that keeps me up at night all the time. Otherwise, the country has over 40 protected reserves, parks, and areas, and 14 marine protected areas and reserves. If you want the real wild side of Vanuatu, you have to go under the ocean. Down under the ocean. This is copyrighted music, and you can't use it. That's like your uh, bootleg mermaid song. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Send me my royalties. Off the shores, you immediately bump into the coral reefs, like the largest one on the north side of Afate Island or by the Mystery Island down south by Anatom. All different types of sturgeon fish, frogfish, nudie branches, hawksbill turtles, and in the Sheffa province, you can find dugongs feeding off of the seagrass meadows. Also, do not confuse dugongs. <laughs> They're dogs. Do not confuse dugongs for manatees. Although they are cousins, they look similar. Remember, dugongs have the dolphin-like tail, whereas manatees have that flat, round, paddle-like tail. All right, that's it for me, and now I have to tend to some animals of my own, my daughters. Pray for me. He has had no sleep. <laughs> I'm so tired. Thanks, Caleb. It wasn't Dugon the name of a Pokemon? Yes, it was. It was like the most lazy named Pokemon ever. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, a fantastic franchise. But on that note, Santo Island is known for having the best raised cows that produce the best beef. Even countries abroad like Australia and Indonesia occasionally might import the high quality meat. To talk more about the food of Vanuatu, we actually have a correspondent that went to Vanuatu to interview the locals to teach us about it. And with that, here's our correspondent, Jackie Boy. Jackie Boy from Uzbekistan episode is here in Port Vila, Vanuatu. And guess what? I found some new Vanuatu people who could tell us more about their local food. The national dishes of Vanuatu is lablab, which is baked pudding. It's out of taro, banana, yam, 
kumala manioc mix with coconut milk and salt wrapped up in banana leaf and then baked in a full canoe stones in port Vila, we have this different type of lap lap so some of the province they have their own lap 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 is usually sold with different toppings like uh, seafood chicken or beef we also have simboro which is a steam roll of grated yam manioc banana or taro wrapped up in cabbage covered with coconut milk so we also have nalot it's pounded cassava and it's um, break in the earth oven and um, also in the coconut milk we boiled it for an hour we just turn into red reddish and then we mix it together and then it's very delicious uh, we also have to look that is a grated cassava or manioc with a shredded pork in the middle and it tastes very delicious also we have punya which is similar to lap lap but banana yam and taro doesn't get grated like many other South Pacific countries, kava is a national drink of Vanuatu as well. Kava is made out of uh, the roots of kava plant, which get grounded and mixed with a bit of water. After squishing the kava, we use this one here yeah, to uh, serve the kava. Hope you will visit Vanuatu someday to try some fresh kava here. In any case, that's all I got for you this time. I'll catch you on the next one. Woo! Thank you, Noah. Yeah, it's crazy how much of the land has played a role in how the people have developed their distinct cultures in Vanuatu. I guess that makes the perfect time to transition to our next segment. The... So, quick distinction alert. A Vanuatuan is a citizen of Vanuatu, regardless of race or ethnicity, and a Ni Vanuatuan is a Melanesian person native to Vanuatu. You'll hear this word a lot when over there. And what exactly is a Ni Vanuatuan person? We'll explain all of that and a little bit more in a bit, but first, the motion graphic. First of all, the country has about one third of a million people and has the highest density of languages per capita in the world at somewhere around 130. At about 97%, the country is primarily inhabited by Ni Vanuatuan peoples, that is, native Vanuatuans, that are of Melanesian descent. They are divided into somewhere around 80 to 100 tribes, depending on what you label a tribe, most with their own oceanic language. From there, about 1% of the country are mixed Ni Vanuatu, and the remaining 2% come from other groups, mostly Europeans and Asians. They use the Vanuatu and Vatu as their currency, they use the type I plug outlet, and they drive on the right side of the road. Which is interesting, considering that literally all the people surrounding them, except for New Caledonia, drive on the left. Big Australia, even the closest Melanesian cousins, they all drive on the left, it's crazy. And uh, speaking of which it's fourth, what is a Melanesian? Well, we've already explained it in three other Melanesian episodes, but I'll give it one last final summary. The Melanesians are a subgroup of people that predominantly live on the insular regions between the Coral Sea and the Pacific Ocean. Generally, they have darker skin tones and textured coily hair, which is why sometimes they can be mistaken for being of African descent. And the interesting thing is, and we've explained this before, Melanesians are the only few non-European peoples on Earth that can naturally grow blonde hair thanks to the mutation of the TYRP1 gene. And of Melanesian peoples, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu have the highest prevalence of blonde-haired Melanesians, upwards to about maybe 10% of their population. Anywho, language-wise, most Ni Vanuatuan people speak their own local native language. Today there are estimated to be over 130. I've heard it go up to like 147. Now they all use the Latin alphabet for their languages except on Pentecost Island. Sometimes you might see the Avauli alphabet being used. It was created by the Turaga indigenous movement to write in certain languages on the island. And if you're lucky enough to go to Pentecost, you might see it on like street signs and buildings. Pretty cool. Now why are there so many languages? Well, many studies speculate and suggest that the catastrophic nature of Vanuatu's islands and the difficult geography may have discouraged inner island travel in the early years. In that regard, it kind of impeded any one group from dominating the others. It was like, let's go over to that island and take it over. Okay, maybe not that one. How about this? Nope, definitely not that one. You know what? I'm just gonna stay home. Never mind it. So then that begs the question, with everyone initially isolated and speaking different languages, how do they all communicate collectively? Well, due to their history of being a British-French condominium, both English and French are official, but they're only used as a first language by less than 3% of the country, which means the third official language is used as the predominant lingua franca between the islands. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Bislama or Bishlama. Now, what is Bishlama? It's basically a 90 90 plus percent-ish English vocab Melanesian grammar based Creole language. And it's interesting, like if you're a native English speaker, you may be able to understand about half of it if you listen really carefully. And to explain a little bit more, here's one of our geography peeps to talk about Bishlama. Bishlama is a pidgin English. You will hear long and long, use the long. Long is used to indicate possession. Long 
is used as a preposition. For example, name plong mi Cristela. Mi kam long plus plong explain em language ya Islam. There are also a number of French words in Islam too, such as la fête, sa fête for knowledge or ability, and sa yen, which means that's it. So you can ask, you sabe tok tok Islam? Thank you, blalan em small Islam. Look at you. Thank you! And tok tok meaning speak or talk, like if you could put the pieces together and figure it out. In any case, religion! The majority of the country at about 83% adhere to various denominations of Christianity, such as Presbyterian, Anglicans, Catholics. Otherwise, the native folk and animist religions typically come in at second. Little side note, yes, Vanuatu has a few of those famous cargo cults. All of them are on Tana Island, by the way. And then you have the Yaonanan village. Apparently they believe Prince Philip is the son of their ancestral mountain god and is revered to some to this day. And the thing is, in Vanuatu, you will hear the word custom a lot, which means custom. It basically refers to all the traditional rituals, practices, and cultural nuances that apply to each tribe and people group. There are too many to list, but I'll just try to summarize some of the largest ones for you. Ambram Island is known as the Island of Magic and Fire, known for their fern tree grade figurines. Pentecost Island is famous for the Ngol, or the land diving rite of passage tradition for young men. People say that it was the predecessor to modern day bungee jumping and they use like elastic vines. It's a cool sight. Malekula is known as the Dog Island because it's shaped like a dog, kind of. And they're sort of like the artsy island with so many different carvings and traditional figurines. Mayawo is the waterfall island with secret societies between men and women. The Banks Islands are said to have the most beautiful women in the country and they are loaded with coconut crabs. Santo is the island with the most French influence and has many tribes that are more likely to wear the namba. Ambai are the Sim Simboro or the red mat people. Tana people are known for loving their grass skirts and being really good business people because they kind of exploit the crap out of the volcano for tourism. And of course, Ifate is the metropolitan powerhouse that fuels pretty much most of the rest of the country and links them to the rest of the world. And that's a very condensed on the surface overview of some of the main islands. But again, remember there's 83 of them and 65 inhabited in over 130 languages and tribal groups. So I can't do it all in one video. So instead, let's try to jump over to a different topic that unites all Vanuatuans, the athletics of the country. And with that, here's art with the sports part. And we're back with the sports part in a shirt that is tighter than Paul's budget. He's li that's literally from my wardrobe. So in regards to sports, every island has its own traditional form of recreation and sport, such as Tikalo, a traditional form of stick fighting popular amongst numerous islands. Their most famous event where you can see these traditional sports would probably be the Nalawan Festival where you can see spear throwing, tug of war, and canoe racing. Oh, you did canoe racing? No, I was in summer school, it was summer camp. And I remember, do not try to push the paddle down because it'll snap right back up and it hit me in the face. I remember that I was like five years Blue marlin fishing is also widely popular, especially among the more wealthy peoples, as is the Kiwanis horse race. In fact, they have the Vanuatu Island Relay in which they go around the entire island of Afate. Granted, they do have national sports federation teams like cricket, rugby, volleyball, and football. And they have their own local competition called the Interprovincial Games in which islands compete against each other. Otherwise, there are four main sporting facilities on three islands, Corman Stadium, Le Mans New Stadium, Luganville Soccer City Stadium, and Port Villa Municipal Stadium. And that's it for me, guys. You're not going to see me at all in the rest of this episode. And this is it. Thank you, Art. Well, and he why? With all of that in mind, to talk more about how the people of Vanuatu have shaped and molded themselves over the millennia, here's Hannah with Culture Stuff. Geographer peeps, me and Robin. Say hi, Robin. Say hello from Alabama. I am out of town, so I am unable to do my segment, but you don't worry, I will be back. You just wait, whoever's taking over my segment, you can't have my job. I'm coming for you. Hey everybody, it's me Hannah from Alabama. I'm here to do my part about culture and stuff. All right, yeah, Noah. <laughs> that was terrible. So Art's gonna fill in. Vanuatu's Melanesian culture is very unique in that much of it plays off of the geography of their islands. For example, early settlements were usually built inland and not on the shores. Some would say it was to maybe avoid mosquitoes, maybe because it was closer to the obsidian or volcanic glass deposits, which was valued and used as currency sometimes. 
sometimes. Another tradition that seems to span many islands, the art of sand drawing, which is actually a complex form of storytelling that intertwines geometric figures representing characters or parts of a story. When completed, it forms a large pattern image. In fact, art, like myself, takes on many forms, and usually it's played a very spiritual role. For example, the Rampa Romp effigy figurines and Malakula, they symbolized a person who passed away and often the skull of the deceased was on it. If the skull was not available or used, they would substitute with an over-molded skulls made from plant plaster, as it was believed the skull was where the soul resided. On many islands, you'll probably see grade wood figurines made of fern trunk. They were believed to serve as the temporary home for spirits. Ceremonial masks take on many forms as they were believed to do certain things like summon the presence of ancestors or help with harvest. Just keep in mind, although they do look beautiful, they're mostly not intended to be souvenirs. They're treated like spiritual relics. If you do want a souvenir, maybe you can go look into getting a beautifully carved pudding knife, dish, or yam pounder. And you know, I've been wanting to get a yam pounder for a while now. Yam pounder, bro. <laughs> you always take my scripts and do this art. You can also get a stamp staff, canoe prow, weaponry, like clubs and spears. But keep in mind, there is a war club and a pig killing club, so don't get the two mixed up. In fact, the Navari pig is the most prized animal of Vanuatu, valued for its meat and used in ceremonies to this day. And yes, pigs are often traded as dowry gifts for weddings. Some people are, you know, given a coffee machine or juicer during a wedding, but these guys are given pigs. What would you prefer, a coffee machine or a pig? I mean, uh... I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of art, not me, definitely watch the movie Tana. It's based on a true story that is the first movie completely shot within Vanuatu. The entire cast is of native descent, spoken in the Nafe language. It was nominated as the best foreign language film for the 89th Academy Awards. Vanuatu is a haven for festivals and celebrations. Each tribe and people group has their own unique one. The Masculine Canoe Festival, the Back to My Roots Festival, the Big Bay Festival, Festival in Santo, the St. Andrew's Day Festival, and the Toka Festival on Tana Island. And to talk more on the Toka, it's probably appropriate to go to Mr. Florida Man Keith on this one. Take it away, Keith. It's me, Keith. So I guess Hannah's also not in this episode, so whatever. Who cares? Um, all right. Woo! So in Vanuatu, they call traditional music sing, sing, or kastom kanis. It means to sing. And in traditional music, there is a heavy emphasis on percussive instruments like rattles and uh, bamboo stomping tubes. That's kind of cool. Some tribes, especially in the south, use conch shells as horns. Uh, you can find bamboo bamboo flutes, but the most popular instrument you'll see shared on many of the islands is the slit drum. Nobody knows who started the whole slit drum thing. They all kind of just piggybacked off each other and started doing it. You have the woman on the Banks Islands doing their famous water dance. Uh, basically, they step in uh, shallow waters and hit, slap, and splash the water in specific patterns while singing. It's super popular. There's documentaries on it. Go check Check them out. I think there's even one on Amazon Prime. You have the sea snake dance of the Ra and Molta Lava Islands on Tana Island. They have some of their most colorful performances with a the toka dance, and uh, which, by the way, it can last for days. One of the most famous dances, though, would be the Ram dance. Some even consider this as the national dance of Vanuatu. Today, the more popular styles you will probably hear across the country include reggae, zuka, pop, ocean beats, and hip hop. Remember to support the local music. Uh, Vanessa Quay is like the current queen of pop, I guess. Uh, she does songs songs in multiple languages and has this these cool music videos highlighting cool sp spots of the country including one of them in the middle of this active volcano it's pretty metal volcanoes in hot lava is metal and i believe it helps create metal anyway so there you go slit drums volcano music videos all of the above my name is keith I am almost as florida as fred durst all hail fred durst and also all hail vanuatu i'll see you later Peace. Woo! Thank you, Keith. Man, making a music video in an active volcano, that's... <sighs> Vanuatu clearly has a lot going on within their own domestic sphere, but they also have a lot going on in their outer sphere. So let's discuss that in the next segment. The... 
So Vanuatu may be small, but with diplomatic relations with 115 countries and seven embassies within their own country, they definitely know how to make themselves known. So here's how it kind of goes down. First of all, in regards to their former colonial rulers, the UK and France still have close ties to Vanuatu. British and French people still visit often as tourists. There have been multiple high profile visits from political dignitaries like Prince Philip, and recently Macron was the first French president to ever visit Vanuatu. Historically though, their relationship with France has been kind of a roller coaster ride. Like today they are part of the La Francophone community and at one point France was their second largest provider of aid but then there was also the time when Vanuatu stepped back from French relations in the 80s to protest the Kanak movements in New Caledonia as well as nuclear testing in French Polynesia nonetheless today things are overall okay but still a little bit of a complication there in Asia Vietnam has a close relationship that dates back to colonial years when Vietnamese workers were brought in during the French Empire and today there is a small diaspora community of Vietnamese Vanuatuans nonetheless Thailand and Japan Japan are their largest export partners, taking in over 70% of their sent products, which brings us to their largest geopolitical friend, Australia. Not only is Australia their largest source of foreign investment, tourist demographic, aid provider, and home to the largest Ni Vanuatu diaspora community abroad, but they also have a defense cooperation program with Australia and host two Royal Navy stations in Vanuatu as well. When it comes to their best friends, however, as fellow Melanesian nations, Fiji and Papua New Guinea are close friends as well, part of Vanuatu's foreign policy is to support the Free West Papua movement, which in return kind of complicates relations with Indonesia a little bit. However, most Vanuatuan people I've talked to has said that their closest friends would probably be either the Solomon Islands or the French Overseas Territory of New Caledonia. These three probably get each other the best as they share many similar cultural nuances and traditions. The people from these areas visit each other often. The more metropolitan citizens may intermarry and have families with each other. The Solomon Islands, Pidgin, and Vanuatu be Islama languages are very intelligible, whereas Francophone Vanuatuans have no problem communicating with the New Caledonians. Overall, these three are like the Coral Sea Melanesian trifecta that has always had close ties and they will always love each other. So in conclusion, Vanuatu is a beautiful Melanesian paradise that just kind of comes with a little asterisk of precaution in case if you know some natural disaster might happen. But otherwise, come and visit it if you Vanu want to. <laughs> Stay tuned, Venezuela is coming up next.